Joining us on the line is Emily Gal. She's director of the Richard and Helen DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. And she has worked on behalf of victims of religious freedom violations in East Asia, Middle East, Europe, South Asia, at the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom, as well as at Beckett Law. Emily, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So let's talk about the Biden administration reviving all of the bad old Obamacare rules with regard to puberty blockers and uh, and irreversible surgeries. Uh, The Trump administration had basically created carve outs, allowing individual doctors and institutions to opt out of performing these types of of transitional surgeries and and uh, and hormone treatments. Um, But now the Biden administration has uh, has decided to put back in place these Obamacare mandates. What, What exactly have they have they changed? Well, they have changed the non-discrimination rule in the Affordable Care Act, and so they have reinstituted a transgender mandate that would force doctors and hospitals and insurers to perform or cover these so-called gender-affirming treatments that includes hormones and surgeries. And that could even affect children, which is why the Heritage Foundation has been uh, trying to explain the dangers of these irreversible treatments on children. So is this going to be, after Bostock, essentially mandated by the Supreme Court? This is sort of my big question is, Bostock suggested that, of course, anti-discrimination law applied to transgender people, that Title IX somehow was designed to protect women, but also men who say they are women, uh, which is a bizarre decision by, by Justice Gorsuch that cuts directly against both the text and the history of the, of the Civil Rights Act of 1965. When the Biden administration is making these sorts of changes and now suggesting that denial of surgery to people who identify as as transgender uh, is a form of discrimination, is that, in fact, just Supreme Court doctrine at this point? No, it's certainly not, because in the Bostock decision, it only applied to, you know, the employment section of the Civil Rights Act, Title VII. And clearly, Justice Gorsuch himself said that it does not apply automatically to the other portions of the Civil Rights Act or to other areas of non-discrimination. Of course, Justice Alito warned against applying the rationale, um, the illogic of Bostock to these other areas. And there are several cases in the lower courts right now that are percolating up that involved this transgender mandate from HHS. So no, Bostock does not mean that the government can just crush the consciences of medical professionals all over the country. This is a separate issue that is being litigated and hopefully the conscience rights of medical professionals will prevail and science will prevail. So when we talk about the conscience rights of medical professionals, um, the the lawsuits I assume that are are going to be filed, are those going to be filed on the basis of religious discrimination or are they going to be filed on the basis of free speech concerns? What basis are people going to to use legally in order to push back against the application of uh, so-called anti-discrimination law in in this context? Well, right now, the courts are hearing cases um, on the protection of freedom of religion and freedom of conscience for these medical providers. And and these are also issues that people um, are very concerned about because of the denial of science, the scientific reality that we are only male or female, and you cannot change from being a male to a female. This is a denial of science. Um, you, the, what they are recommending is simply a cosmetic change to a person's appearance that does not resolve the underlying sense of distress that people have with gender dysphoria in most cases. And it, it's a denial of science and it's overriding the consciences of medical professionals, their understanding of what is good medicine to simply tell them you have to do this to affirm a person's internal sense of gender identity. We're speaking to Emily Gao. She's director of the Richard and Helen DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. Emily, isn't this just indicative of the sort of broader problem that we we now have in the legal community of broad-based, quote-unquote, anti-discrimination laws that obviously violate rights of conscience, that that obviously uh, are, are cracking down on freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and that increasingly courts are, are using in order to curtail exactly those sorts of core freedoms? There is a huge problem in our law and in our courts now because the traditional understanding of civil rights law was based on the immutable immutable categories of race and sex. That's what was in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And now we've moved into this area of adding sexual orientation and gender identity 
gender identity is not certainly not an immutable characteristic. It's a person's internal sense of what their gender identity is, and that can often change by definition. It is changing in the cases of many people, especially those who identify as non-binary. And now we're adding that category into non-discrimination law. It's being weaponized by activists to force other people to affirm a person's identity, their internal sense of identity. This is totally different than the original intent of civil rights law to protect people from invidious discrimination that denied them essential goods and services. We're speaking with Emily Gao. Of course, she's at the Heritage Foundation. So Emily, one of the things that's so disturbing about all of this is the attempt by the Biden administration, not just to apply this to adults who want these sorts of therapies and surgeries, but to apply it to minors who want these sorts of therapies and surgeries. Well, we now have many states in which, for example, in Washington state, if you're 13 years old and you walk into a gender clinic, they can start handing you testosterone without any sort of parental supervision. You know, it's it's kind of insane that, that the Biden administration would wish to federalize that. It is very dangerous, and we've seen tragic outcomes for children and young people. There are many young people now who regret having started to try and transition, going on puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, even having surgeries before they're 18. And as you point out, many times the parents are not involved. In states like Oregon and Washington, you can cut out the parents uh, when the child is still a teenager. And children are not adults and we cannot allow them to be um, told this lie by transgender activists that they can transition from one sex to the other because as we're seeing in the uk you know where a detransitioner a young woman named kira bell she sued the gender clinic that rushed her into hormones and surgeries because She was only a teenager. She wasn't able to give informed consent. And now also Sweden and Finland are following the decision in the UK and limiting hormones for children. Children in the United States deserve the same protection that children in Europe are getting from this transgender activism and the dangers to their bodies. Emily Gao over at the Heritage Foundation. Appreciate what you're what you're doing and appreciate your work. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you.